Hey y'all, Data Guy here. And today, I have a video for you where I want to really just kind of take and distill all the airflow best practices for running airflow in production at a real company for real world use cases and go through how real companies out there are setting up their infrastructure, how they're setting up deploying DAGs, collaboration, best practices once you're in production, monitoring how you can scale airflow to the tune of tens of thousands of DAGs, CI, CD, and some optimization best practices. All together in this video, so you have a toolkit of exactly how you can implement some of the best practices of airflow in your own environment so you don't have to kind of struggle around and figure it all out yourself. Um, so without further ado, going to start this off just with talking about how, you know, the different options for setting up and just running airflow in production, and then we'll get into all the fun stuff that comes on top of that. So the first thing you're going to want to do is decide how you are going to run airflow. And you want to run it on a Kubernetes cluster. Um, some people, when they're risking sort of airflow, they think, hey, this is just like, you know, any other kind of off the rack application, I can just toss in an EC2 instance or some cheap compute and it'll run fine there. It's not. Um, Airflow is designed really around, you know, having a couple central nodes manage a dynamic amount of worker pods. You can kind of see represented here where you have, you know, based on the amount of tasks you're running at any one point in time, you want to have that many amount of workers. And then you also want to have a mechanism that scales those workers down when they're not in use. Designing that yourself is going to be really hard to do. Um, designing a system where, hey, you know, when I'm not using Kubernetes workers it's, or when I'm not running tasks, spinning all my workers down to zero, it's not really something Airflow comes with out of the box. Airflow is more reliant on like a set of worker nodes that are available to it. So that's where you're going to want to go with something like a managed solution. You know, you can design all this yourself. There are many large organizations out there that do it, but it becomes a full-time job to build and then maintain a scalable production-grade airflow environment. So highly, highly recommend you check out managed airflow providers like Astronomer, um, MWA, GCC, but Astronomer definitely is going to be your best option for large organizations. And I know I'm biased because I work there, but it really is true um, just in terms of having easily scalable environments because they're the only ones that can turn off dev environments and also scale your worker nodes down to zero. Because a lot of times with Airflow environments, you don't need a large set of workers for a large set of time. You know, you're running, let's say, you know, jobs daily or hourly, but there's a lot of downtime between those jobs that are, you know, that are occurring. And if you're working with a platform that can't scale properly during those downtime, you're just paying for a bunch of compute that's sitting there idly by waiting for the next capacity. That's where going to a managed solution, if you don't want to invest you know, the engineering hours, which obviously aren't cheap unless you, know, you have a really cheap source of, of good engineers, um, into building and maintaining that platform yourself, much easier to make use of a platform that will scale for, to, for you, which even though, you know, hey, on a per compute unit basis, it might be more expensive, you're going to end up saving money in the long term because you're not paying for workers or compute that you're not actually using. So just in summary, make sure at least you're using Kubernetes because that will allow you to either use Celery Executor or Kubernetes Executor. The choice between those is really, hey, if you need a really big isolation between tasks and you each task to have its own separate runtime environment, Kubernetes Executor is probably the right move for you. But if you're doing anything high throughput, you're making use of parallelism, where you have the same packages and libraries for all of your tasks, use Celery Executor. It's going to decrease your time on spin up. So it's going to be quick, really you know, milliseconds quick to deploy workers, which again, cuts down on idle time where you have workers sitting, uh, you know, what you're paying for before they're actually spun up. Kubernetes is going to be a bit slower, but if you need that per task isolation, it's a good fit. Otherwise, Celery is going to be largely cheaper, faster, um, and just generally is my preferred option, kind of default option when working with Airflow but you'll still need a Kubernetes cluster to actually power those salary worker pools. Also, in terms of your metadata database, so you still can use a default Postgres metadata database. 
it's gotten a bit larger in you know more recent iterations of Airflow, and you can expand it yourself as well. So if you're using Ecoms really heavily, recommend using you know a larger metadata database because you'll be passing a lot of metadata between tasks. And then additionally, for saving all that metadata, having kind of dump off archival point, recommend having an object storage location like Amazon S3, Google Cloud Search, whatever object storage you choose to use. As after you know every 30 days, have a API request that dumps or you know script that dumps all the data from your metadata base into that long lived archive and all those worker logs, all the logs from your Airflow environment. So you don't clog up your Airflow environment with super long lived logs and you still have those for retrieval if you never need them down the road for you know compliance or, or any other type of purposes. Um, and that really covers all the kind of optimizations you want to think about when you're doing your Airflow environment. Actually, additionally, worker pods. So a big thing to consider is most workloads in Airflow don't need a lot of actual compute because they're triggering operations that are happening happening elsewhere. So when you're deciding which worker pods to use, it's important to you know choose an initial size, but then monitor and make sure you. And I'll talk about this later in monitoring. Make sure that you're not over consuming, which means you know that worker pod isn't consistently hitting its CPU and RAM limits, or under consuming where you know you're only using like 20% of the available capacity for your jobs um, because then you can either over be overpaying for compute that you don't actually need or your task could be running really slow or even fail because they don't have the amount of compute or memory that they need as well. So another important thing to decide when you're choosing which type of compute pods to use on your Kubernetes cluster for running your workloads. Um, I think that is really everything around infrastructure setup for Airflow. So now going to move into how you want to think about deploying and storing DAGs um, and really thinking about CI/CD and collaboration in Airflow. Now, let's talk about CI/CD and how you want to design your kind of path to production for Airflow. Number one, you want to make sure you have an option for developers to develop locally. And what this means is you'll likely have a GitHub repository, and you can kind of see here you'd have a Git brand, a Git repo, where you have your production branch, which is linked to your production Airflow deployment, and then you have automation to say. When code is deployed into my production environment, deploy that code into, or in my production branch, deploy that code into my production environment. And likewise with a dev branch, when code is deployed into a dev branch, deploy that into a dev environment and maybe run some scripted tests. Now, the way your developers will then interact is they'll take the image either from the production or dev branch, uh, download it on their local machine, and then start using it typically through Docker Desktop. Um, so you'll want to use a Dockerized version of Airflow, and that's also will make it easier to work with Kubernetes and just have a single source for everything related to Airflow, your requirements, packages, DAGs, all bundled into one. And then that means all of your developers, they can develop locally from this common toolkit. They can develop on their local machines. Once it comes time to deploy their code, they make a merge request into the dev branch. And you can either choose to allow them to merge without admin approval into that dev branch and then deploy that code into a dev environment. Or you can say, hey, I actually, as an admin, I want to control who's able to test on a dev branch at any point in time. And this is really pertinent if you have multiple developers. You, that way you can make sure, hey, I'm only merging the pieces of code the developers worked on and making sure they're not overwriting each other when they deploy into dev. And that's also why having local development is really important is because you don't want to have the risk of just, hey, I have one dev environment that everyone has to use because that means you have to then coordinate, oh, okay, who can test their code at which time? Um, and it just makes it a lot harder to then you know say, hey, I wanna test this code and then make a change. It's always gonna be much longer to have to deploy that code into a cloud environment rather than having it run on your local machine as just a simple test bed, even if it's against dummy data or you know non-production non -production data sources. Um, so that's really important. And then you have the dev uh, prod branch model where you have your branches linked to their respective deployments as I described earlier. So that is typically the setup I've seen people have the most success with um, because you have one single source of truth for your code environment. You have your production environment protected by CICD controls, not allowing people to deploy into it directly, uh, similarly for your dev environment. Um, but you give all of your individual developers the ability to develop independently so you don't slow them down while still preserving the security of what code is actually going to be deployed into which environment. And in terms of CICD providers, pretty much any of them will work. Um, there's, there's no real specific requirement to use like GitHub or GitLab. Really, 
it's not that complex of a development paradigm, and this is pretty much just mimicking standard SDLC best practices. Um, so any CIC tool you might be using in your organization will be fit for purpose for this. Now, next, I want to talk about some DAG writing best practices, how to make sure you're writing efficient DAG code while also making sure you're doing it in an automated way and show you kind of how you can have scripts that will actually do that testing for you. So number one, and this is just a really easy one to implement, but a lot of people don't consider it, and that is avoid top-level DAG code. And what that means is avoid code that happens outside the context of your Airflow DAG or task because that code is going to be parsed and ran every time your DAG processor loops through the different DAG files, and that's going to massively increase DAG processing times and just introduce a lot of additional load on your Airflow environment for no good reason. Another great tool is automatic retries. A lot of times, you know, especially for really tightly coupled tasks, if a process, you know, let's say you're moving data from one data set to another, and maybe the next task gets scheduled almost too quickly before that system because it slows down for some reason in actually transferring the data, so the data isn't available in the spot the task has that, you know, expects it to be. Automatic retries can help save you the trouble of calling those errors when really just rerunning the task in 30 seconds or five minutes would have fixed it. Um, and so automatic retries have that happen in an automated way to get around those kind of common, easy to solve fixes. Another best practice that you're gonna to wanna to make sure you implement is atomicity. And what that means is that each task should only be handling one specific job. You don't wanna have a task that's doing your entire ETL process within a single task. You want to have the extraction happen as a single task, the loading into a database happen as a single task, transformations happen as single independent tasks, um, and there's a few different reasons. Number one is for better visibility of where your you know, data pipeline actually is in its life cycle, um, and also when you're looking at logs, knowing that you're looking at logs just for that particular uh, piece of that, of that data pipeline. You're not trying to parse through a massive list of operations just to find the small segment that you're interested in. Um, and also, it makes it much less fragile. If your pipeline fails at a, sing, you know, a single step in that script, you're gonna have to re, you know, even if it's towards the end of that script, you're gonna have to rerun that entire pipeline if it's all just you know, one big task. However, if they're broken up into individual tasks, you might just need to rerun the final task within a pipeline, not the entire one. So end up saving a lot of time and also make your pipelines a lot less fragile by implementing this. Additionally, you want to make sure that you design all your tasks with item potency in mind. And what that means is for the same input, each task should output the same output. Um, so you don't have random operations or things where you don't know exactly what's going to happen when you have the output of the task. You want to make sure that for every time you have a given input, it's going to give you the same output. And then finally, avoid repetition and make your tasks modular. Um, instead of trying to design your own operation tasks, try to use things like providers um, instead of just you know making custom Python scripts for every single task. Some people try to do that with an Airflow because they think that's the best way. In my opinion, leveraging existing providers or templatizing your Python scripts so that you can use them as reusable task operators is a much more efficient way to do this code and avoid just having to copy and paste boilerplate code and really turning your different steps, your data pipelines into reusable building blocks so that you can create new data pipelines more easily and continue to grow. Now, in terms of implementing these tasks um, and these kind of checks to make sure that your code is up to snuff, you're going to want to implement something like a PyTest uh, that is run whenever you're deploying your code to a branch or as part of your CI CD process. And this test could look something like this where you have here, this is just an example DAG test that's making sure that, hey, there's no import errors in the DAG bag, so kind of protecting against silent errors, um, making sure that each DAG ID is unique, checking for any import errors, making sure that DAGs have the proper tags on them. So making sure you're using tags to organize your DAGs, another great way to make sure you know, it's, your DAGs are easily searchable because you can filter for tags within the DAG UI. Um, and then also making sure you have a retry set, all those things like that. And then also, if I go to the actual Airflow UI, um, we can see how those tasks, or how those upgrades make our DAGs more searchable. So here, because I have all my DAGs properly tagged, if I just want to look at the DAGs for a particular uh, type, for a particular grouping of DAGs, or just DAGs that a particular owner has provisioned, so each year, you know, uh, you could have a check to make sure that owner is assigned for all of your developers to make sure they are assigning a proper owner so it's easily 
accessible to know who's deploying which code. Um, and then you can also filter by running and failed DAGs to help you organize the UI and know exactly uh, and look for exactly the DAGs you're looking for, especially pertinent when you're going into the scale of hundreds or thousands of DAGs, just scrolling through the entire UI is a pain. Now, finally, we have monitoring. Um, and so for monitoring, a lot of times you're either going to have to, if you're running Airflow yourself, open source, build it yourself. If you're using a managed service like Astronomer, you'll have something like this actually built into the platform. So you'll want, you know, even if you're building this yourself in Grafana, we'll want to have a dashboard where you can see the DAG runs, task runs, but also the CPU usage for your different worker pods. This is how you can do some of that optimization I was talking about earlier, making sure, hey, my workers are actually being appropriately sized to the tasks they're using. In this case, this is an example of a worker that's way oversized for the tasks that it's actually doing. Um, and so making sure that you're using the right worker for the right tasks can help save you a lot of money in the long term by using smaller workers instead of larger ones. Um, additionally, you want to look at CPU memory usage for your scheduler nodes, um, your scheduler heartbeat to make sure it's healthy. And this also will tell you when it, it might be time to actually increase the size of your scheduler. Um, you know, if your scheduler is constantly running at the max of your CPU and memory usage, um, you're going to want to introduce a larger scheduler because you, uh, you otherwise might experience uh, performance degradations over time if you're constantly overloading your scheduler um, and also just limit your growth and speed of scheduling. So those are really all the different considerations I thought were relevant and you know things you want to think about as you implement Airflow in production. Um, so I hope this has been really helpful for you. I hope you've learned something from this. If there's a topic you didn't see covered in this video, let me know um, and I'm happy to make an extension on this. But I hope you've learned a lot. Great, have a great rest of your day. Data guy out.